Okay. Anna to me can be so excited and I hope I can transmit a little bit of this. And especially the endoscopic transnasal surgeries, they are mainly or, or highly uh, anatomic orientated procedures. So we do not use the, the fluoroscopy during surgery like we do in microsurgical pituitary surgery. You can use the navigation, but don't rely on the navigation. And in most procedures, navigation is not possible. It's a purely anatomical orientated procedure. With the endoscope, you can reach the skull base from the posterior wall of the, the frontal sinus, along the cripiform blade, sphenoid sinus, till to the, the second uh, vertebral body. But I will focus on, on this area, that means the cellar region, because this is something like the epicentrum in endoscopic skull base surgery. As I am strict, not say constrained, I prefer to do these procedures in a systematical way, so we separate these, the whole procedure in some virtual stages called the nasal stage, the sphenoid stage and the cellar stage. And during uh, these stages I will highlight some uh, anatomical landmarks that are really critical and very important during this uh, presentation. Um, you always have to be aware if you're using an endoscope that you do not have a virtual image. You have always a distortion by the endoscope. So this is, these are square millimeters. You have a distance of five millimeters to your target and you will see that the, the structures in the center, they appear larger than those you see at the side. Yes, but this, on the other hand, this means if you have a plain uh, target area, the target area seems distorted like this. On the other hand, if you have like, like in the sphenoid sinus, you have a, a concave area like this, it seems more or less plain. So always remember that if you have these, these endoscopic images. We heard about this, uh, this anatomy of the nasal septum and of the lateral uh, wall of the, of the nasal cavity. Remember, the nasal cavity in the bottom is very wide and it becomes very narrow if you are going to the, to the top. And it is narrow in the anterior part, it becomes wider in the posterior part. You see, there was no landmark at the nasal septum. It's more or less flat. You can may have some distortions of the septum or you may have some, some spurs, but there is, there is no defined landmark. The only thing is if you have the septum and you have at the bottom, the bottom of the nasal cavity, you have an angle here. And the first step in endoscopic surgery is to follow this angle. So you go along at the bottom to reach this area and then you can look up and you find your, your landmark. So orientate, if you're disorientated in the nasal cavity, always go to the bottom, see this angle, nasal septum and nasal floor, and then you can reorientate. And then the terminates, inferior terminate, lateral to the inferior terminate, there is nothing special for us. And as Dr. Roy showed, lateral to the medial terminate, you see the entrance to the maxillary sinus, which is important for more extended procedures. So I want to show a video of a specimen like, like a skull base, and this is an endoscopic view. You see there is the angle, septum and the nasal floor. There is inferior turbinate, middle turbinate. The cartilage part is removed, of course. Lateral to the medial turbinate, you see the uncinate process and the entrance to the maxillary sinus. This is maxillary sinus here. This is midline, this is the rostrum. These are the osteas. They can vary in shape and size, but they are always there. You cannot always see them because they can be covered by mucosa, but they are always there. And the rostrum always is a midline structure. It looks like the keel of a ship, yes? And if you see this, you know this is midline. It's always in midline. The septum may have some deviations. The septa is in the sphenoid sinus may have some deviation, but the rostrum is always midline. So you can orientate by this. Okay, first look with the endoscope in the nasal cavity. You see something like this. Sometimes you cannot say if this is inferior, superior, turbinate. Go down and see this. Yes, nasal septum, the floor of the nasal cavity, and the, the most inferior turbinate is the inferior turbinate. So you see this is inferior turbinate, this is middle turbinate, and this is the direction you have to follow in the angle in between the nasal septum and the floor of the nasal cavity. And follow this angle, nasal septum, floor of the nasal cavity, you will reach the nasopharynx. Yes, it's very easy. You see the coane here, 
this is nasopharynx tubal elevation. So you have your first landmark, yes, the coanae. And then lifting slightly up the endoscope, there is coanae nasal septum. You see the attachment of the middle turbinate here. You see the attachment of the superior turbinate. And you see this is a small hole. This is the foramen, the ostium to the sphenoid sinus, which is the bony part is much larger than this, what you're seeing here. And this is called the sphenoetmoid recess. So nasopharynx, coanae, nasal septum, attachment of the middle turbinate, superior turbinate, anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus on one side. And uh, I want to highlight again the sphenopalatine artery because it's important in some cases. Um, the sphenopalatine artery is running through the sphenopalatine foramen and it's divided in two branches, which the lateral branches is called the posterior nasal artery and supply the lateral wall and the conchae, responsible for the blood supply, the lateral wall and the conchae, and the posterior nasal artery on the nasal septum is running to uh, supply the, the nasal septum. And this is important in some cases. First, if you want to open the sphenoid sinus here, you can damage this branch of the sphenopalatine artery and the uh, re-bleeding after surgery, this is the most common cause of a re-bleeding of the nasopalatine artery here. So you have to do a good hemostasis at this artery if it's bleed during surgery. You, you can handle it, it's not a problem, but you have to do a perfect hemostasis or you will have a re-bleeding after surgery. Second thing is, if we will talk about the uh, nasal septal flap tomorrow, nasal septal flap is a flap built by the mucosa of the nasal septum and it's a vascularized flap and the blood supply of this flap, this is which is necessary to reconstruct some openings, approaches in the skull base, the blood supply is running via this artery. So this artery is running here and this is the pedicle of the flap and the flap would be built here. So in case if you prepare a flap, you have to be cautious to not to harm the artery or you will have a flap without a blood supply. And the third thing is, if you're going for searching for the, in more extended procedures, you're going for the, for some the median nerve or for the sphenopalatine foramen, you follow the artery to reach the sphenopalatine foramen. So it's a landmark to, to orientate. I want to highlight the position of the sphenopalatine uh, foramen. You see, this is palatine bone, left side, right side with a perpendicular plate and a horizontal plate. At the perpendicular plate you have two processes. One is the sphenoid process and one is an orbital process. And really uh, there is a part of the orbit formed by this um, orbital process. And there you have the sphenopalatine notch. This crest is uh, the attachment of the middle turbinate in the posterior part. And this crest is the attachment of the inferior turbinate. And if the palatine bone is connected to the body of the sphenoid bone, you see this process is connected to the body of the sphenoid and this process to the greater wing and to the orbit and this notch, this is the sphenopalatine foramen and it is superior to the attachment of the posterior part of the middle turbinate. You see it in a magnification, this is sphenoid bone, this is palatine bone, this is the coanae again, so nasal septum here. And uh, this is the sphenoid process, orbital process, and there is the sphenopalatine foramen. And if you're coming from medial to lateral and removing the mucosa here, you mostly can see this suture. Then you know you are uh, at this process and follow more lateral, you will reach the uh, sphenopalatine foramen. And uh, the sphenopalatine foramen extends to the pterygopalatine fossa, which is here. This is maxillary artery with one terminal branch. This is sphenopalatine artery running to the sphenopalatine foramen. You see here, what is this? Rotundum, second division of the trigeminal nerve. You see here the pterygopalatine ganglion, which is connected to the vidian nerve. And the vidian nerve is running like this. So this is foramen rotundum, and the vidian nerve is running here, I'll show you. Yes, so you reach the, the pterygopalatine foramen, you reach by removing the posterior part 
of the maxillary sinus. You see here again, foramen rotundum. Again, the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. You see there is the connection to the ethmoid bone with the ethmoid air cells. You see again the rostrum, which is always midline. You see the osteas, very important. And what we're doing in sphenoid surgery, there is nothing behind this area, so you can go in here, remove the anterior wall, and this is a safe area. And now the anterior wall is removed. You see some septimes, as mentioned, they can vary. They can be a middle septum, it can be lateralized, and you almost always, the lateral septimes are connected to the, to the paraclival carotid. So there are landmarks, you can check this on your pre-operative CT scans, which is very important. And uh, so you have a good orientation in the sphenoid sinus by the knowledge of how are the septums in this individual anatomy. This is not general anatomy. This is individual anatomy of your patient. Yes? To the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus, you see the paraclival carotid, cavernous part of the carotid, pituitary. You see this is second diversion of the trigeminal nerve. You see here the vidian nerve and the vidian artery running from the sphenopalatine artery. There is an anastomosis to the carotid artery via this vidian artery, pterygopalatine ganglion, optic nerve of thymic artery. And again, a slightly oblique view. You see again, this is third nerve, first division of trigeminal nerve. You see here the abducens nerve running to the relos canal here. These are some sympathetic fibers running with the carotid artery and here the second division of trigeminal nerve and you see here this is the anterior medial triangle so on the other side of this there is the temporal fossa. You see this now from the other side, second division, first division of the trigeminal nerve. You see these known triangles. This is Parkinson infratrochlear triangle, Parkinson's triangle and you see this is the anterior medial triangle and the anterior lateral triangle and looking from the temporal fossa you have excess in between to the sphenoid sinus. Glasgow's triangle covers this triangle. So looking to the floor of the sphenoid sinus, you see this is the anterior wall sphenoid sinus. There are some septis and on the floor sometimes if you have a well pneumatized sphenoid sinus you can see those elevations here and these are the elevations of the Vidin canal. So they are running in and sometimes above the floor of the sphenoid sinus, yes? Vidin canal here, running to the genu of the carotid artery at the level of the foramen lacerum. And now for us the most important structure is the, the posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. One difference between uh, transcranial approaches and transnasal approaches is that you're, if you're doing a transcranial approach, you do your approach from, from a pretty safe area, yes? You, you do your approach at a safe area and then you can reorientate to uh, find your target. While doing endoscopic skull base surgery, you are immediately at the side of neurovascular structures. So you have to be really sure where to open and where to have to take care not to harm neurovascular structures. And you have always to remember if you see this, what is on the familiar side, and you, you know very good this anatomy, and you are not that familiar at the moment with this anatomy, yes? So I always have to remember what is on the other side of my bony structures. The first thing always is to determine the midline. So you have the planum sphenoidale, the tuberculum cellae, cellar floor, and clivus, and you pretty often can very easily determine the midline, okay? So you first look for the midline and you are here now. And then to go more laterally, this is an oblique view. This is the anterior clinoid process here, posterior clinoid process, anterior clinoid process of the right side. And you see the chiasmic limbus here. You see the tuberculum cellae here. And what is this structure? The optic struct, which is a a critical structure in endoscopic skull base surgery. So there is a tubercular crest and sometimes a medial clinoid process. And these crests of the optic strut, the medial crest of the optic strut, the um, tubercular crest, and if not absent, the uh, crest coming from the medial uh, clinoid, 
is forming this structure, which is the so-called medial optical carotid recess. Yes, so here is the medial optical carotid recess in between the optic nerve and the protuberance of the carotid here. And this area is here. Okay, so you have the optic strut, which is a little bit like a drop, and the sharp side is medial here. And now you have those two additional landmarks. And then looking from anterior, you see this again is optic strut, and you see the lateral part of the optic strut is the border to the supraorbital fissure. That means if you're opening the optic strut, which is running like this, here, the lateral optical carotid recess is the lateral border of the optic strut, and so opening this, you will end in the uh, superorbital fissure where all the nerves are. Okay? In the vertical plane, you have those landmarks. And now looking for the horizontal orientation, and um, you can very good orientate by the curves of the carotid in the horizontal way. So you have the parapharyngeal part of the carotid, you have the horizontal part in the pedro's bone, you have the paraclival part, you have the cavernous part, and you have the paraclinal part and the intradural part of the carotid. And uh, a landmark to reach the genu from the pedro's part to the horizontal paraclival part, this landmark is the video nerve, we have seen it in the pictures before. So this is the first landmark for the horizontal orientation, and the next landmark is the end of the paraclival, um, carotid going to the cavernous part and you see this is you have always have this area this means this is the area of the medial part of the cavernous sinus you see there is abducent nerve here so you have here the level of the abducent nerve at this, uh, at this area and so we are looking for the most complicated part which is the cavernous sinus and uh, to look for the cavernous sinus and to understand ones have to look for the laminas and for the membranes of the cavernous sinus. Like always in brain, you have the dura is, consists of two parts, of, of the endostal layer and the meningeal layer. Yes? So you will have bone, you have an endostal layer. So this is skull base, you have your endostal layer. This is the meningeal layer here, and this cavernous sinus is in between the endostal layer and the meningeal layer. At the lateral part of the cella, you do not have bones, so you do not have an endostal layer. You only have this meningeal layer here. And this meningeal layer is the layer belonging to the pituitary. So it's called the pituitary sac. Yes? So the medial wall of the sphenoid sinus is the meningeal layer of the pituitary. And in between the meningeal layer and the endostal layer, there is the intercavernous sinus flowing. Okay? And um, in between the cavernous sinus, you have some vessels, you have sometimes fat, you have some nerves. The third nerve, the fourth nerve, and the first division of the trademal nerve, they are attached to the wall of the sphenoid sinus. They are not running in the wall of the sphenoid sinus, but there is an arachnoid layer running around these nerves. So it is not a dual layer, it's an arachnoid layer. And this layer attaches those nerves to the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus. The only nerve which is without this arachnoidal layer is the sixth nerve, abducent nerve. So the abducent nerve is running extra dual because he has lost his layer. And when do the nerves are losing their layer? They are losing their layer while passing the foramen. Yes, and the foramen for the abducent nerve is the relos canal, which is more uh, proximal. And uh, at this level, the, the abducent nerve is passing the endostal layer and there he loses the arachnoidal sheet, and so he is the free-floating nerve in the cavernous sinus, and the other nerves are connected via these, these arachnoidal layers to the wall. And there were some membranes running from these arachnoidal layers to the carotid, I will show you. So you see, view from anterior, you see this is the endost layer, which is removed in the lateral part. And this is the lateral compartment of the cavernous sinus here, the middle compartment, lateral compartment. You see this layer is forming this structure, and this is the distal dual ring. So it's formed by the endostal and meningeal layer of the cella and of the horizontal plate. 
you see later. And uh, going more ahead, you see part of the endost layer is removed, and this is the meningeal layer of the pituitary, and it's running around here, yes? And this is the uh, wall of the cavernous sinus. And in between those two layers, there's the intercavernous sinus running here and here. And here is a, an artery, which is the inferior hypophyseal artery, coming from the uh, horizontal part of the carotid artery, and uh, is the, uh, responsible for the blood supply of the, the pituitary. So inferior hypophyseal artery, and uh, you see it again here. You see this is the meningeal layer of the pituitary, and you can, you can separate the pituitary with a plant dissection from this layer. Intercarbonous sinus, and again, the inferior hypophyseal artery. And only to show these are the superhypophyseal arteries. They are very important, not only for the blood supply of the pituitary, but also for the blood supply of the chiasm. So if you damage them, it can cause in blindness. Only to show this is the intercarbonous sinus, superior and inferior, and the carotid sinus. And this is what it's meant to do the approach till you see the four blue lines. Yes, these are the four blue lines intercarbonous sinus and the sphenoid sinus. So these are the borders of the opening if you're doing pituitary surgery. And now looking from above, you again see this, these layers. This layer is forming the distal dual ring. So it's removed here. You see this is distal dual ring formed by the horizontal blade and coming from the other side from the cellar. Now the anterior clinoid is removed. You see distal dual ring and you see this structure and this is the proximal dual ring. And this proximal dura ring is running from the arachnoid layer coming from the oculomotor nerve. I've seen there are some set ties, and this is very frequently and then very stable membrane running from the oculomotor nerve to the carotid and forms actually the roof of the cavernous sinus in the anterior part. So this is the roof at the level of the proximal dura ring, the roof of the cavernous sinus. Again, a few from lateral, you see oculomotor nerve, you see this is the membrane running from the oculomotor nerve to the carotid. And this is the, this membrane forming the proximal dual ring. This is the distal dual ring. And in between, there is the paraclinal part of the carotid. And now the optic strut is removed. And removing the optic strut, you have access to the sphenoid sinus. So this is the lateral optical carotid recess you have seen, and lateral to the optical carotid recess, the nerves in the, the superior orbital fissure. So we have again these landmarks. That means the landmarks of the distal dual ring, which is here. The, the protuberance of the carotid you see here is the protuberance of the paraclinoidal carotid artery. Yes. So this is the level of the distal dual ring. Superior to it, you are intradural, and this is the level of the the proximal dual ring and inferior to the proximal dual ring, you are in the cavernous sinus. Yes? Inferior to the proximal dual ring, this is lateral cavernous sinus from here to here. It's, it's a very tiny space. Yes? The medial part of the cavernous sinus can be larger. It depends on the elongation of the carotid, how much it, it's elongated. So this is the endoscopic view. You see the protuberance of the paraclinal carotid, you see lateral optical carotid recess here, medial optical carotid recess here. This is the floor of uh, the cellar. There is tuberculum, protuberance on the left side, lateral optical carotid recess, and the clivus here. Um, view to the intratubal space, this is the um, suprachiasmatic area. You see looking the um, transnasal to the bottom of the chiasm. You see there communicating complex, communicating artery A2, A2, A1, A1. Yes, and there, what do you expect there? The lamina terminalis, yes, and here it's opened. So you have a suprachiasmatic route to the, to the ventricle, to the third ventricle, yes. Retrocellar area, so the dorsum cellum has to be removed. Then you can transpose the pituitary upwards. You see the mammillary bodies here. You see the tip of the basilary artery. 
P1 segments, you see ocular motor nerve here, Com posterior communicating artery here, P2 segments here, ocular motor on the left side, and you see trigeminal nerve here. And here is abducent nerve running to Dorello's canal. This is Dorello's canal here. Okay. And to show the nerves in the lateral part of the of the cavernous sinus, you have to remove the bone above the cavernous part of the carotid. And then you can medialize it. And you see here is oculomotor nerve in the cavernous sinus. This is abducent nerve. This is trochlear nerve, and this is the lateral compartment of the cavernous sinus, which really is a very tiny area. Or as Kassam said, the, the cavernous sinus is more inferior than you think it is, and it's smaller than you think it is. Okay, thank you. <laughs>